Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm really happy you came to see my talk. Hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, breaking electronic locks like you're on CSI Cyber. Before I begin though, on a serious note, I'd like to have a reading. A reading from the journal, the fine book of the POC or GTFO. And this will help us reflect on the talk and think about what we're going to learn today and throughout the day. I've chosen a reading. Uh, three, two, and let us begin. There is an old name for what people do with big ideas and important concepts that are so important that you cannot hope to have their internal workings understood without special training by special people. It is called worshipping idols, and what we ought to do with idols is to smash them to bits. And if the bits do not make sense, then the whole of a most modern capitalized fashion does not make sense and the special people are merely priests promising that supplicating the idol will improve your affairs. Not that anything is wrong with priests, but idols teach no skills. And if your trust is in your skill, then you should seek a different temple and a different auger. Or, better yet, build your own damn bird feeder. I want to reflect on that as we move forward in the day. So a bit of a confession. Originally I had thought of giving this lot, this title a more clickbaity name, like break into locks with one weird trick. But then I was like, no, you know what, it might give people the idea that I'm going to break into all sorts of locks. When it's really just there's a particular thing I'm looking at, I'm sort of showing you something I built that I think is interesting, and showing you a little trick about that device and how you can um, sort of test that as a consumer. Unfortunately, I still feel like it might be not be enough. And all I ask that is that I don't wake up tomorrow and end up with news headlines like this when it's really just like, here's one interesting lock, here's one interesting thing I, I'm doing, and I'd like to share that with you. So quickly about me, if you've seen other presentations, um, I've said for years that I'm almost done a PhD, I swear to you. And I actually did for once, so I actually finished that recently. Um, yeah. <laughs> Contrary to what you might think, it happened. Um, as part of that, so I have an open source project called Chip Whisper. Chip Whisper does power analysis, glitching, a lot of um, more advanced embedded attacks, basically. It's not used in this talk uh, really at all. I'm doing some other work here. Um, but that's what, that's what I've probably done the most on. Also, what's not on these slides, according to this super zoo tag, I'm also the premier owner of HFX Pets, the pet import export company. Um, so if you get sick of Black Hat, you can go enjoy some dogs or something too. So what sort of locks am I looking at? There's a whole bunch of electronics locks. Um, there's various types you'll find. There's stuff like high security ones on safes, um, residential ones so on the left and right here are residential locks. And it's more the residential ones I'm going to be looking at in this talk. The threat vector, for me the most interesting thing is you have the front side of the lock so you just have access to like this keypad. And what can you do there? Um, I'm not really looking at like reprogramming the lock or evil maid type attacks. Uh, you know, you might say like, oh, this thing has a Z Wave radio or IoT connected. And from the back side, you can hack into that and hack into the rest of your network and make your toaster, make your bread slightly too toasty. Um, so we're not looking at all of that. We're also not looking at mechanical attacks. Um, when you're dealing with these, there's kind of like a bit of an ecosystem of, well, is it easier to just kick the door down or pick the lock? Um, and for a lot of the electronic keypads, I think that's the real threat vector is not the electronic part, but just the old keyway part or your door isn't as secure. Um, but yeah, and it's also the other thing I like to point out, uh, I talked to the vendor about this quite a while ago. Uh, they've been very receptive. So not only are they sort of working on a fix for the specific problem, working on improvements really that will fix a whole bunch of other problems I might not have found. Um, and they already had a uh, newer product coming out that had this problem already sorted. So it's been really good to see that, uh, that it's more than just, you know, like the vendor pushing it off or putting in a really half assed fix that only partially fixed the problem. So it's really good to see that sort of response. All right, let's get on with it. Um, so this is what I was coming into the talk with. I said, you see the movies, there's these sweet, you know, you bypass the lock with this card reader you put in, the digits come up, and it's all really great, and that's what hardware hacking should be. 
but what is hardware hacking when you go to the talks? It's a bunch of these nerds talking about JTAG and serial ports and stuff like this and there's some stuff on their desk. Um, so you know that's, that just doesn't seem as cool remotely. Um, even though the JTAGulator is very cool looking, it's just, it's not the same. So that's what I wanted to fix. And I looked at a few types of locks previously. Um, high security locks I'm calling, so these are like on safes and stuff like that, as well as residential locks. So there's a bit of a price difference between the two, as you might expect. Um, on the high security safe keypad, this is a older one, but what I wanted to point out is that on the front of, so you have the keypad here, and by design, if you take this keypad out, there's not a whole lot in it. So on the inside of the keypad, it basically has some passive elements. Um, and on the back side of the lock, it's doing all of the intelligence here. And there's quite a bit of um, sort of protection on weird signals going into the back side of the lock. So from the front side of the lock, it's very hard to do any sort of attacks onto the back side. Most of the residential ones I looked at actually had a much smarter front panel, um, which opened up some different attacks to me because I was able to do a lot of send messages to the back side, do some weird stuff. Uh, I looked at two different residential locks. Number one, vendor A, I picked up and I thought it was going to be a cool one, but there was a problem. That's by default to add a new user code, you press a button on the back of the lock and then you just put the new code in on the front and that's it. Um, and you can set a special programming code to prevent that, but I don't know if that many people will actually do it. And in fact, if you look at the lock, and you pull the battery cover off, it tells you instructions for how to add like a, a new code to the front of, to the lock itself and the button you press is like right here. You need a little piece of something to hit it. Um, but it, in, in terms of threat vector, it seemed like that's probably the biggest vector. Maybe the users use it correctly. Um, so then I started looking at a different lock, vendor B, and it was more interesting because I think it was a, a better lock, basically. Um, it didn't have this default no programming code. By default, it did have a, a code you needed. All the codes were written like on the back side of the lock, so when it's installed, you can read them, um, and you could change them anyway. But even if you didn't change them, an attacker couldn't figure out what they were really easily and change them, add their own codes or stuff. Um, so the lock itself, basically, there's a little data cable between the two the two sides, so the front and back side. You can see this cable here. Um, and the front side has quite a bit of smarts. If you rip apart the lock, so this is what the main board looks like just out of interest. There's a bunch of features on it. So there's like a Z Wave radio here. Um, the Z Wave radio has uh, your IoT connectivity stuff. Uh, there's a microcontroller that's running the lock itself. Um, there's a siren. So there's this alarm feature. And to do that, there's a siren. There's a transformer here that just generates higher voltages. Um, and there's also an accelerometer. I'll show you that working. Um, and finally, a motor driver at the bottom here. On the back side of the board, there's a whole bunch of test points. So I've added some annotation on my physical board. Um, but there's a whole bunch of test points. So, like the Z Wave serial, I think I've like marked out. Um, and all of these things when I was testing it, I soldered on. So I didn't look at the Z Wave side at all. This is the entirety of my Z Wave research, is me saying I didn't do it. This is purely looking at the physical attacks on the hardware. Um, there is some interesting stuff on that particular chip, so it's used in a, a lot of products, uh, and you can sort of see some of those references. There's likely to be some potential issues there, but I really didn't push into that. Um, the accelerometer is basically designed to detect different levels of tampering, so if someone's playing with the lock, um, I think the idea is they're jiggling it, maybe trying to pick it, I don't know. Um, it might be a little oversensitive then. So it probably is going to be annoying, but really the, the good thing is, you know, if someone tries to force the door or kicking the door down, you can set these different sensitivity levels, the alarm can go off. Um, it also goes off if you put too many wrong pin attempts in. Um, so that's sort of a nice little feature there. Let's just take a look at this lock to see, see what it is. So here's the lock. Um, and so if I arm it, if I lock it, okay, that's working. I'm going to turn the alarm on. And then if I arm it.
it'll lock. And I'll hold my hand over the back, so if I like hit this hard, you can hear it's going off. So there's a little alarm feature. And if you put too many wrong pins in, the same thing, so I think it's turned off now. Just make sure. All right. So that's kind of cool. Um, so that's one thing we might need to bypass is if you were brute forcing it, this alarm will go off eventually if you put too many pins in. Um, so the issue with this lock comes about from there's this front panel, and if you take something and put it into the front panel, you'll find that it sort of can be pulled up like this. Um, so I had a screwdriver here, and you can pull it up all the way, um, and you get this little board. So this board is like a, there's a microcontroller on it. Uh, and it's doing your your keypad, and it's sending stuff back over the cable to the back end. For comparison, so vendor A, the lock that had this kind of evil maid type attack, um, what they did is you can see the there's this flange, this plastic flange here, and basically the metal goes over the flange, so it's going to be a lot harder to do that same type of attack. Um, so this is what made the attack more uh, possible in real life: is that you can just take the keypad off from the front side without changing anything. Uh, it's very hard to get it back on would be very tricky. Um, on the lock I have I've sort of stabilized it just for demo purposes. In real life you would need like a very very precise sort of um, ability. I think it's just possible but it's at the level where it's like uh, maybe easier to pick it than even to get that thing back on without, without being obvious that you remove the panel. But if we just want to break in we could remove the panel and attach our, our fancy board. So we have this cable that we can send data to the back end of the lock, and in particular we can send guesses. Uh, so it's a simple serial protocol. You can send a message to the back end to say okay here's what the user entered in, um, and there's no real timeout on that. That's one of the issues. Uh, the, the front panel is enforcing how quickly a user can press the buttons. So if you send to the back end like, you know, one, two, three, four, with no delay between them, it's fine. It, it won't complain about that to you. The other thing is that there's power. So this front panel needed power. So there's 3.3 volts for logic on the, the board. There's also the battery voltage goes to the front. Um, and we can short that out. So that, that same power goes to the back end. So what happens is that if you short the power out, it's just going to reset the microcontroller. And it can disable the alarm. So that's kind of the attack is these two things in combination. We can brute force really quickly up to three or four guesses. After the, you put too many wrong guesses in, the lock goes into a timeout. Um, you have to wait 30 seconds. But if we reset the lock, then we can just do this again. Um, so there's a bit of delay when the lock boots up, but it's not really excessive. So this is breaking locks like the movies. I've built this board, which of course has to have the seven segment displays. Um, because it's going to show you what guess it's doing at the time. It's not exceedingly fast, so you'll see it would take about 85 minutes to do the whole, the whole thing. So this is where it's sort of like a fun demo. It's, it's questionable, you know, compared to just kicking the lock down. So I'll show you how we'll do this is we have a butter knife that hopefully Mandalay Bay isn't missing. And we just remove this. Oh crap. So you have to be careful if the alarm's on. Come on. I forgot it was still on. Uh, it's quite sensitive as you can see. Okay, there it is. So now I can move it around without worrying. Um, if this is on a door, obviously this is super uh, unstable. So it makes the alarm go off a lot easier. Um, and then we have my board here. Hopefully you can see. So we stick that right there. Oops. Plug it in first. So we plug it into the little cable. And all it's going to do is it's just going to start guessing. So it starts guessing. Let's see if we can find a stickier part of the tape here. It just starts guessing. And eventually we'll open the lock. All right. So what we're going to do is we're just going to put this down for a second until it gets closer. Because I'm going to talk a little bit. So it takes a minute to start guessing through them all. Um, let me just pull up the slides. So as I mentioned the time, the time's about 120 tries per minute. 
Um, so that four digit key space is going to be searched in about 85 minutes. So the full key space. Um, if it's closer than that, as we'll see, then it, it's going to open sooner. Um, I just start at the top and count down because th the one or two locks I looked at um, tended to start with nine something for the default, one of the default pins. Um, you can try four pins, which is a little faster, but the issue is that the, the thing's going to chirp on you um, because it's going to set the alarm off and then what it's going to do is you're going to reset it, but there's a little bit of a chirp before it resets. So I'm just going to stick this up here. Okay, there we go. Um, so hopefully you can see it counting down. The lights are a little bright maybe. Um, and eventually, what is the correct one? 9758. Um, so eventually it's going to get the correct one. So you can see the three guess and the delay as it then reboots the lock. Um, so that's really the, what slows it down the most is that little bit of delay. So with any luck, so there you go. So you can see it stops and then the lock is closed if you didn't notice. Um, yeah. So we can run that again in the background. Uh, the sort of interesting thing is there's a programming code too. Um, so there's the four digit user code. There's also a six digit programming code. So this programming code lets you add or remove um, entries to it. And you might say like, oh, six digits, so it's going to take even longer to brute force. But the cool thing is if you send the first four digits of that programming code, um, what's going to happen is it's not going to send back wrong code. Like if I put in four digits of the wrong pin, it says, nope, that's the wrong code. If you put in the first four digits matching the programming code, it just sends back nothing because it has to wait for more digits before it can tell you if it's right or wrong. Um, so the remaining two digits you can then brute force really quickly. So the kind of cool thing is you can also get the programming code out of this, um, which is interesting because then not only could you learn, you know, what the code the user has put in, um, but you could potentially learn the code to be able to add your own combinations later. Um, so it's kind of an interesting little bonus about this type of thing. So I'll switch back to that. Uh, the easiest, so how do you fix this? Um, in firmware you could add a power up delay. So if you put the batteries in, you wouldn't really care about the fact that it's taking an extra, you know, 30 seconds after you put batteries in before it, um, before it actually lets you use the lock. No one's going to really notice that. Uh, you can enforce a reasonable button delay. So obviously the button delay, I'll see if I can move this so it's not so bright. People in the front row might unwittingly be in this. Okay. Uh, the reasonable button delay would be really useful there too. Um, and stuff like that. So you can see it works pretty well. And the other thing you could do is you could have a little bit of a timeout after each wrong guess. So right now after each wrong guess, I can then send back the, um, the next wrong guess right away. So a bit of each wrong timeout after each wrong guess, um, as well as a writing this timeout to internal memory. Um, there's some physical things you could fix. So this gets a little trickier because someone might send down a really powerful pulse in the thing, but um, you could add some circuitry to a special cable basically to fix it in the field as well. Some things I haven't tried looking at yet, um, fuzzing the serial interface. So obviously there's the serial connection between the two guys and maybe you can send other commands down that. Um, realistically it's probably just taking the button presses but it's something someone could look into. Uh, the Z-Wave side, as I mentioned, I didn't really look into very much. Um, and we, we do have access to this power line of the micro right now. So there's some more advanced attacks we can do called glitch attacks, which basically cause the system to perform uh, unintended operations. So that's another thing to look into. Um, finally, so these last two are like with Chip Whisper. Anytime I do a talk, I somehow shove these topics in it. Um, power analysis is basically looking at the power as the device is running. So from the front side, the issue is that from the keypad, we have access to that VCC line. Um, it might, it, it looked like there was some signal there, but basically from the front side, everything was pretty unaligned. Um, from the back side, which is a much less realistic attack, at least initially, um, you got a little bit of basically this is the, the power trace as it's putting in a wrong key guess, and you didn't see anything that was obviously time dependent. So this power here, what I was interested in seeing is like, you know, if the first digit is wrong, is it obviously quicker when it's checking if that first digit is right or wrong? There was no obvious timing attack right away. Um, this was all pretty preliminary though because 
the real point of this talk was CSI cyber and this is very not CSI cyber, this is very nerdy hardware hacker JTAG type thing. So it didn't fit as well. Um, and uh, again I just have a second slide in case people weren't here for the first slide um, that they have been really useful in, in working on a fix and the fix I know is basically forthcoming um, beyond and even beyond the particular flaw exactly that I exploited um, to improve the overall security of it. The one thing I mentioned real quickly is that as a consumer how would you know this lock had the problem? And this is kind of something the last sort of point um, is that as a consumer the easiest way you could test this um, well I've taken the keypad off but basically you have the keypad on here you could try putting in four wrong digits and you can see that if you power cycle it so if I go on the back side and just um, plug and unplug the, the battery connector like that um, you could see that the, the delay that timeout that 30 second timeout um, no longer happened. Uh, like it, it didn't continue to wait and say oh you put in four wrong digits and you power cycled me um, but I'm still going to make you wait 30 seconds. So that's like something you could test even without any crazy hardware stuff going on. Uh, so it's just sort of an interesting uh, note on that side. But yes, that's basically a real quick version of hacking electronic locks like you're on CSI Cyber and like CSI Cyber it's very hype and it's maybe of questionable value in real life um, but I hope you enjoyed it I hope you learned something about the locks. I guess if there's any questions I can quickly take one or two I think three maybe three minutes. Okay. If not there's a uh, a room afterwards that we'll go to that we can talk about. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the question was if there's a recommendation on locks that are safer. Um, offhand, I mean, on the commercial side, it's hard to say, or on the residential side, um, I'm not sure exactly if you're looking for electronic. This particular one, it seemed like once they fix it, it'll be quite good. Like besides this issue, I didn't see any other major problems. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs>